yeah. good first step. Okay, I'd like to uh, open the meeting of uh, the uh, November 16th uh, uh, meeting of the uh, Barnesville County Commissioners. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to, and to the, the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me now in a moment of silence while we still think about the troops that are coming home by the end of the year and hope that they are no longer in harm's way and that uh, they come home safely. Thank you very much. Is there any public comment? Well, the audience will just have to be quiet because we have business to take care of. They will tap us on the shoulder. Yes. Right. <laughs> so with that, uh, it's uh, it's five past ten, and uh, we have our good friend Paul Rashinskis, and our subject is close to my heart. Uh, yes. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Good morning, good morning Sheila. Good morning, Paul. How are you? Good, thank you. I'm here to do my annual report on commission affordable housing activities, and also to uh, report I went out of state back in May to a home conference in okay. D.C., so it also yeah. it's it's related yeah. 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 So why don't I pass around this, and I'll just quickly go over um, what we were up to over the past uh, year. Um, Thank you. And the first one's uh, the home consortium. I think I end up spending about half or more of my time on the, the home program um, activities. And we got... Uh, a little bit under 750000 uh, last year. We ended up spending about the uh, same amount uh, of funds. It always doesn't work out that way. And just on the first page of notice of the, the funds that we spent resulted in $53 million worth of project activity. So we have an incredibly high leverage factor. Our dollars go a long way, um, usually because we've put the smallest amount of funding into any particular um, project. But it's and an efficient use of resources. It was a pretty busy year. Um, fewer units than normal got created. We had five projects uh, that actually got done, but only 21 units, so they're primarily small ones. Uh, the largest one, as Bill is uh, very aware and, and should be very proud of, is the uh, Thankful Chase's Pathway uh, development in Harwich that the Housing Authority um, uh, basically planned and, and helped uh, execute on that one. More good news. We're looking at um, uh, trying to put some money aside to uh, get an adjacent property uh, to perhaps expand. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Adjacent there? Oh, yeah. excellent. Excellent. And uh, this is in conjunction with my uh, the, the home conference, but it, when we were down in, in D.C., uh, at the conference, the, the HUD awarded 28 awards to projects of uh, that fulfilled certain criteria and thankful Chase won uh, honorable mention in the sustainable development uh, mm -hmm. category. So again, right. you should be uh, you know, incredibly proud of that. It's a LEED Platinum Certified um, Development. It's just a, it's just a terrific, terrific project. So. They also use that as a uh, point of contact in Harwich for, you know, for an example of, uh, of uh, recent successful housing development. So they had uh, uh, so, uh, there was a, the development partnership uh, brought uh, some people in on a tour and had them come by there. Right, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So as I say, that was the, the biggest one. Uh, we've got three projects underway, 168 units, and we made commitments to eight uh, projects with over a million dollars. So we've got a uh, substantial amount of development in the, in the pipeline. Um, and on the second page, it's just a another summary, but, but overall, in the what, 17 years the consortium has been in existence, uh, our funding has gone toward 829 affordable units, the overwhelming majority of it rental, which is our biggest need, and a little over 15 percent of all the affordable units in the, in the county have some home fund them, funding in them. So I think, again, we've, we've used this uh, federal resource uh, extremely well. Um, Paul, could I just ask sure. a question about yeah. the rental? When did the uh, when did the need begin to shift from ownership to rental? And I guess I'm wondering how long that that will go yeah. on until it shifts back again to ownership. Yeah. Is it totally related to the economy? Or? No, Mary no? Pat, I would honestly say it's it's. I mean, they're both incredibly needed, but I would mm -hmm. I would say always rental housing is a little bit higher priority, mainly because of just the you know. Housing costs are higher here. They're about 10 percent higher than the rest of the state. Our wages are about 30 percent or more lower than the rest of the state. So, the, in the kind of economy we've got, just 
the folks who are making twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars a year, they just need, you know, a so seven hundred, eight hundred dollar uh, a rental. So it's, it's something. At least since I've been here, the ten years, I'd always put it in the, you know, a bit ahead of, of home ownership. In terms is, of isn't it sort of an inventory issue too, Paul? Because your stock is mostly single family oh, homes, yeah, yeah. basically. So yeah, so basically. Yeah, I think. Um, what is it? Yeah, I mean. Roughly 80% of the yeah. stock on the Cape is single-family home. It's 70%. The latest census was, I think, just almost 70% owner-occupied, 22% right. rental. So we've got a different kind of housing mm -hmm. stock here than it's typical for the rest of the Cape. Anecdotally, at town meeting, when I try to get the property for, you know, set aside by, you know, by the uh, uh, town for uh, development uh, rental units, the pushback that I get from town meeting is that they would prefer that they be, you know, they'd be available for sale. Oh, sure. So in terms of demand, uh, in the time that I've been, you know, involved with housing, there's always been a need for a lot more rental units, mm -hmm. but there's always been that, uh, you know, that problem of getting through town meeting sure. and supporting, the, you know, the rental units uh, where, the, you know, town meeting wants to have everything sold. Yeah, no, absolutely. Politically, home ownership is an easier sell than, than with the units. Uh, sadly, but that's... Yeah, I think the reality. And yet, um, there's, you know, uh, people looking, I mean, I've talked to different people who are considering doing uh, affordable housing, mm -hmm. but wanting to do it on the rental side. And as far as the state is concerned, yeah. that money is being looked at more, they're looking more at rental projects. Am I correct in that? Uh, almost, almost entirely, Sheila. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the state is done it's almost no funding for um, single for ownership over the last <laughs> three, three years, I'd say, right now. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, most of the state resources are for rental housing. Okay. Unfortunately, they're not doing that either, right? Now. No, but hopefully with... Well, hopefully yeah. DHCD will, you know, will, re will appoint someone to replace Tina Brooks because right now there's chaos as far as supporting housing needs. So that's, you know, that's a very important area. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I also, in uh, the case, too, that there's not only... It's, it's, you know, creating housing that's desperately needed, but it's also an economic development activity. We had five projects in the last from the Cape in that last DHCD funding round. Unfortunately, one got funded, but those five represent $27 million worth of construction work, and by and large, contractors are local, and it's local folks, and the money stays in the economy and circulates right. here. So it's it does both here. Um, um, can, can I ask one other question? Sure, on sort of this home program yeah. piece. And it seems we've got about 750 every year that mm -hmm. I can remember. It's about that. Yeah. And that's all federal money, right? All federal, right. How is that looking going forward? I'm going to get into that. Okay. Horrible. Right. Yeah. Uh, horrible. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, the, the sort of downside of the, on the home program uh, last year was our down payment program. We only did six down payment loans. Our average tends to be 35 a year. And what happened was two years ago, in response to a request from the uh, city of, of Newton, HUD made a, a determination that the sort of deed restriction that the state uses, the so-called universal deed restriction, is in violation of a couple of home, um, both the statute and the regulation. So we can't use home funds and anything that uses this universal deed restriction. And unfortunately, the way the HUD ruling was written, it basically meant we can't use Basically, all our prior deed restrictions were, you know, in, in, in effect, not consistent with, with home. So it's really put an absolute kibosh on any home on any ownership activity that we can support. The only down payment loans we're making now are for market rate homes that don't have any restriction on them. So it's been a real, it's had a significant impact here. I spent the better part of a year trying to work with DHCD, work with HUD to see if there's a a resolution and on the federal side it really the only resolution would be um, a change in the statute and I just don't see that happening mm -hmm. at all and on the HCD side they really invest a lot of time in this deed restriction which is wonderful it survives for closure um, and so I'm just not sure where we're headed but right now we're basically just using pretty much using home just to support rental development and it's um, again it's um, it's really narrowed what we can do in the, in the program. It's unfortunate because sooner or later we will, you know, ownership activity will pick up, and we'd like to be able, you know, I'd like to be able to support some of the local projects. And right now we just can't do it. So. There, there was uh, an effort several years ago to provide an opportunity for people who were in subsidized housing to uh, 
to put aside part of their rental yeah. uh, in order to develop a down payment, right. in order to purchase it. Right. Uh, there hasn't been any, any attention to that, but I suspect that this might be the time when that could be resurrected because as we support more dwelling units, right. I think we should think about let's say, providing a pathway to, uh, let's say, to that opportunity. Yeah. Well, actually, I think the Barnesville Housing Authority still is working and doing <coughs> that self-sufficiency, and you know, I think they had either one or two of their tenants actually mm -hmm. move into units that the uh, Housing Authority bought with CDD, uh, CDBG and other funds. So, uh, at least in Barnesville, there's, it's obviously small scale, but they're still keeping that as part of what they're attempting to do. Could I ask another question? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know the situation over in Yarmouth with the motels and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Right. So, you probably read in the paper that um, Mr. Bragington Smith is looking at one of the right. and we'd like to right. redevelop it and make it rental right. affordable right. with with some business mm -hmm. element right. to it and economic development issues. Is that something he could talk to you oh, about? Well, actually, he, he called me and we were supposed to meet, oh gosh, oh, good. Okay. in September, but he got caught in Chicago and right. there was some huge storm, so he just hasn't gotten back to me, but I, uh, yes, absolutely, it, Okay. that's the kind of thing that yeah, so you would we be could saying. absolutely. Because, I mean, he has talked with the state, and the, they're all, this is a great project, but right. they just, they don't have it right now, and they're hoping maybe we're at the end of the turn of the year. Right. <coughs> but right. if there's something he can, because right. it's actually, it, it's a very sound idea if it could come right. to fruition. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. If I speak to him, I'll make sure he yep. follows up with you. Yep. Excellent. And just on the third page, um, we spent our funds in 10 out of 15 towns this past year. Historically, we've put money into every single community. We've got a, we've done a development or supported development project in all uh, 15 towns. Mashpee was the last one to uh, come on board, but we supported the Habitat project. And we've done well in terms of minority um, outreach. Over 17% of um, home assisted households over the last six years have been minority households. Great. So it's more than double the, the county's uh, minority percentage. And then lastly, HUD requires we have a set of performance measures, and I've attached that to the end of the report. There are 15. Um, because of our s low level of production this year, we just hit on um, six of the 15. Over time, and looking at what's in our pipeline, I'm confident we'll meet our goals over the five year term on, on the rental side. On the home ownership side, I honestly think unless something changes in the next six months or a year, we're going to have to revise our home ownership goals because there's just no way we can do, tw you know. 20 down payments a year or 10 or 15 home ownership a year with just being unable to do so with the deed restriction item. So that will just have to, again, unless something changes, we'll just have to adjust the goals because we just can't meet them under the current scenario. And then on the page four, just some of the other um, <laughs> things. Probably the, the other major thing we spent a good deal of time on was in, uh, working on this regional ready renters program that includes five towns from Barnesville to uh, Chatham spent a lot of time working on DHCD to come up with a, a marketing a affirmative fair marketing plan that will enable units that have been permitted through local affordable housing bylaws uh, to be able to be counted toward the town's 10% because right now a number of these units aren't for example <coughs> the Barnesville accessory apartment program this enables them to stay on on the inventory so um, we finally got DHCD's approval at the end of 2010 uh, we got the five towns on board. We contracted out for Bailey Boyd Associates to run the lottery, which they did from February through the end of May. So in June, the commission took over the uh, administration of the, the program. So you mentioned Bailey Boyd. Mm -hmm. you know, there had been a problem in Harwich uh, on that last. Uh, right. Now we did uh, we did get uh, support from you know from town meeting mm -hmm. uh, or excuse me from the board of selectmen to let's say to support the child care piece of it. Right. So, uh, but the point is that that, that does leave a hole. You know, in, in the overall oh, it does. You know, resources it does. that we have to support right. that particular segment. Right, right. And, and since June, we've, we've actually um, filled two of the vacancies. So it's designed <coughs> for existing units that are pretty much already filled. And when the landlord has a vacancy in any one of these, he contacts us at the commission. We go through our <coughs> list and send him um, income eligible tenants. Uh, as I said, we've done one in Barnesville, one in Yarmouth. What we found, however, is that most of the, not su surprisingly, I suppose, most of the folks who are on our list are really at the low end of, you know, they're at 30 percent of income or below. So what those folks can afford is five, six, seven hundred dollars a month. Most of the 
all of the town bylaws are written so they can set the, the, the rents at basically what somebody at 80% of median can afford. So we're getting one bedroom apartments at $950 a month, whereas most of the folks, that's way, that's out of their range. So there's mm -hmm. that gap between you know, the town bylaws and what the maximum rent, because you want to have landlords participating, so the inclination is to set the rents higher, but it doesn't match with the pool of folks the are really reality. looking. Yeah, with reality. So. Um, we can use that to, to, to That's work why the on. term affordable sometimes throws me because uh, yeah. the yeah. guidelines don't really yeah. Yeah. dictate it. Yeah. Uh, we sponsored a LEED uh, affordable housing workshop um, almost a year ago. There are five LEED certified affordable housing developments on, on the Cape. So. Tell people what the acronym means. Pardon? Tell people what the acronym Lead. means. Oh, I'm sorry. It's um, Leadership in Energy Efficiency and uh, Design. Um, and it's a rigorous set of criteria to it includes not only energy efficiency but how you cite it, water conservation, use of native plants, recycling materials. So it's really a very sustainable way of, of building. And you know, ultimately, in terms of the energy efficiency, long term, it's really providing uh, benefits to either the owner, if it's an ownership, or to the the tenants or owner of uh, rental units. Um, Tied in with that, uh, the. Uh was at the Community Development Partnership uh, told us last night uh, at, uh, at our housing meeting that they got a grant from uh, uh, TD Bank North. They were one of 25 they that were selected to uh, put in PV on uh, you know on uh, certain residential uh, construction. Of, of, their ex of their existing units, which is just spectacular. Yeah, they, yeah. they figured that uh, it would mean a, a $300 savings to some of the tenants, and in some cases as much as $600 when they get to the Energy Star you know, piece of it. No, absolutely. And that's that's really important for most of the folks who are living in, in, in their units. Really. Um, you know, did a chat and bylaw for model bylaw. Um, <coughs> Beth and I applied for another fair housing uh, grant this past, I think it was in, in August, and we received a score of 97 out of 100, but still that wasn't good enough to get funded. So I don't know, it must be incredible competition nationwide. Uh, for this, our score last year was 93 out of 100, so we even improved our score. But um, did they give you any feedback on well, what would make bump it up to a higher? They, no? they they used to, but just this last year they did not give you your, your score. So there are like there are I think five different categories where you can get scoring. So I don't even know where we lost the three points and then right. how we can um, get them back. Address it. Yeah. Um, can you get the winning ones? Yeah, just see what they, they they they're really slow mark in putting them yeah. on online. Um, I think the last I looked, those from the the awards were uh, applications were like three years ago. So um, yeah, that's not that. Hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if the congressman could help you pick up some of those things. He has a great interest in this area. Mm -hmm. you know, congressman Keating. Uh, that would be worth Yeah, I think it would be worth a try to, to get that because I think we want to we want to know as much as possible. <coughs> yeah. why, you know, why if you get 97 out of 100, yeah. and why we wouldn't question. qualify, yeah. I think that's something you could get an answer for us. Well, I'm sure the funding is limited, you know. Yeah, but but not, still, but Also, it's not necessarily in HUD's interest to let you know. Well, <laughs> it's in our interest. They, I think they, 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 they have a hole in their head. Most of the time, most of the grants, they do have these feedback sessions where you can call yeah, up exactly. and yeah. go over the, the, the grant with them and they'll explain but for whatever reason for this one over the last two years they just said we'll give you your score but okay. but the need the need continues to be very great I mean I, I go to my own housing meetings on a monthly basis and continue to you know be concerned about the you know 300 families right. that yeah. you know that are on waiting lists right. so I think that it's worth you know bring this to the attention of someone who's supposed to be able to you know put a little pressure on you know on that area because uh, the figure of for every dollar that's spent to support these things, one cent, you know, one cent is you know basically for uh, prevention of homelessness. One cent is for you know for building housing, and ninety-eight cents you're dealing with consequences because there's no, you know, let's say no decent housing available. So I think that it's worth you know yeah. worth some push to okay. get we'll do on this. And then I'd just like to talk a bit about the the conference in. Uh, Bethesda in, in May on the, the Holmes uh, 20th anniversary conference and uh, one of the highlights there is there's been a million units created on the home program uh, nationally. I think they said the millionth unit was a habitat house in Owens, Owensboro, Kentucky actually. And as I mentioned there, there were awards giving out and Massachusetts did really well with the, um, the 14 sort of 
non-honorable mention awards, three were from Massachusetts, and then in the honorable mention category, five of the 14 were from Mass. So Massachusetts got eight out of the 28 awards nationally, one of which was uh, Thankful Chases. Uh, you know, attended a, a number of interesting workshops, um, uh, went on a tour of uh, Arlington, Virginia, and what they're doing. It was just interesting. I, mean, I did spend the time talking with a fellow who's director in Owensboro, Kentucky, and you know, there an affordable house goes for $70,000 a year. Take the tour of Arlington, Virginia, where the median single-family house price is north of $700,000. The big construction costs of $200 to $225, and it just, it just, I mean, you know the national differences, but it is just, you know, Stay stunning great. to see just how different the uh, various communities are. Um, one of the really, I think, interesting things that HUD is doing, and hopefully they'll have time to completing, is they're developing this real mapping system so that, and they did a demo. Uh, at the conference and I uh, watched a webinar in uh, August on it as well. But if, if the system works, you'll be able to go on this uh, mapping website and really be able to pull up in any area of the country and even down to the zip code um, certain um, basic census data and they're trying to incorporate some economic development data in there along with names, address, and information on all the affordable housing in, in the region. And really it'll be a way to help communities sort of map out, okay, you know, do we have a concentration here? Do we need more here? But it, it, it looks like um, you know, an excellent system and really be useful information. So again, I, they're hoping, they're planning, the plan is to have this roll us out in, in April of next year and hopefully their budget will enable them to, to do it because I think it will be a really useful thing. It also helped in um, the annual reports that we've got to submit every year and also for the funding reports. I mean, honestly, a lot of this stuff in there is really not critical. I mean, it's a lot of cut and paste with the five-year plan and everything, and so they're, they're, they're attempting to really more automate that so I can just pull out from our existing reports and plug in and, and do the report electronically and, and hopefully make our lives a little bit uh, easier and, and make the information that's being submitted more useful. Because I think the really key thing is, all right, what are our housing needs here? What do we want to spend the, the money on and why? And have there been any changes that would cause you? And I mean, really, that's the fundamental, I think, of what you want in a, a plan. And um, there's a lot more stuff that goes into these uh, annual plans and I think are really <coughs> useful for folks. Yeah, the money goes down and the reporting requirements go up. Yeah, right. you know, kind yeah. Of thing, yeah. And, that, and that's what the, the high, uh, one of the other things of the, the, the conferences, one of the challenges with the home program is they've had a couple of audits. and. You know, it's a block grant program, so there are 11 cities and 8 consortia statewide that get it, so there are 99 communities that get home dollars. And in other parts of the, the country, there's either the, the nonprofit capacity is not great. There have been cases of more political influence, perhaps, than should have been done to support various projects. And there are some projects just got caught, you know, a number of um, communities invested in home ownership projects three or four years, you know, just when the market was coming down and they can't sell them. So, and the Washington Post came out with a story in, in, uh, later in May on uh, about 2% of home projects that were started three or four years ago that haven't finished or, or whatever. So, there's been a lot of, uh, unfortunately, negative press on the, you know, on the home program, even though I think it's somewhat unbalanced. But um, what's happening is that, for one, HUD is going to come down with a new set of regulations that will require more oversight, more monitoring, and, and more walk, work on everything. Mm -hmm. At the same time, finally getting back to, to Mark's question on, on the funding, it's, uh, we're looking at significant cuts. The, the House budget cut home by 25 percent, the Senate budget by almost 40 percent. So that's in conference. We're supposed to, um, well, the continuing resolution ends, I think, um, Friday. Friday yeah. So the expectation is that there will be a vote on at least the HUD part of the budget along with to extend the uh, continuing resolution. But it, it best case, a 25% cut will bring us down to about $500,000 a year. 40000 will get us to four hundred. And you know, as you can see on the chart, 619 was the, yeah. this one, the smallest amount we've ever received, and that's when the program started in, in 94. 715 has been our, on our average. That's so, all before the whole the budget committee stuff, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. that could be. So who knows? Yeah. And um, so it, it's it's really going to significantly impact what we can 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 do here. So we're going to have obviously some tough choices in the spring, trying to figure once we know how much money we have, is what we're going to spend yeah. it on. Because right now it's just housing development projects and down payment, and um, we're just going to have three jobs. We got to have some place. 
people will live. Oh, I yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely right. Bill. But it's, it's and, and again, it just kills me. I think we've, particularly in this county, have done a very good job of spending with the money in uh, an efficient and productive way here. It just, uh, it's just fewer you know, affordable housing developments we're going to be able to support with our dollars. So, um, so yeah, we're looking at really uncharted budget times for <coughs> next year, and I don't. It doesn't seem as if it's going to get much better in the in the future either. So, Paul, could you say again what the acronym HOME means? There is no acronym. Oh, there is no. There acronym. is. It just means you know home. why? It's just, but I, I, I don't it appears know. all the time in crossword puzzles. On a very less serious note, oh, really? it does appear in crossword puzzles, yeah. and it always yeah it's, it's amazes a, me. Yeah, the name of it is, is HOME, all capitalized. It's just Investment HOME Partnership consortium. Program. But, is, is so the, it has no meaning. It has no. It means home. I mean, it means home. It means yeah. home, but right there is it, no. There is no acronym for America. So maybe everybody who does the course with us thinks it's home, and therefore they put home in there. I don't know. <laughs> Well, it is the Great Lakes. Huh? It is the Great Lakes, as we all learned. Well, that's true, too. Yes, you're on, what is it, Erie? Erie. Oh, yes. Ontario, and, yeah. Michigan, Erie. Yeah, right. so that's Superior. true, too. So it could be that instead of this. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, so any other? Yeah. Uh, Paul, Great. as usual, your, yeah. your reports no, are you your, uh, your, uh, platinum as far as your know, first standard <laughs> of information. Unfortunately, the information is not, you know, it doesn't give me a warm fuzzy about being optimistic about yeah, what's going I'm on. Sure. Yeah. I, 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 I see this every month in my own housing authority where we, where we have a lot of goodwill, you know, in Harwich to support things, but we still don't have the, you know, the resources. Uh, the only success that I've seen recently is, uh, let's see, is, uh, uh, coalitions of private and public sectors, you know, getting together to, you know, where the public sector can identify some opportunities mm -hmm. for profit for land, and then the uh, uh, the private sector, you know, gets involved with regard to putting together, the, right. you know, financing vehicles in order to in order to build housing. There is still an enormous need, as, you, as we all know, an enormous need for dwelling units, right. regardless of whether they're, you know, a purchase or rental. And uh, the you know the focus and concentration of programs like the accessory apartment and you know in Barnstable doesn't seem to have caught on in some of the other areas, yeah. but it's certainly it's certainly a vehicle where we could develop more you know more uh, rental stock. Yeah. Uh, what's the takeaway you want us to have today? Well, I don't want to leave you on it totally down. I think one of the positive things I've seen is really is communities really using community preservation funds in a lot of creative and significant ways. I mean. Uh, the recent projects that we've been funding, there's been more town money in the in the mm -hmm. developments than there has been county home money. A uh, number of communities have done even things like rental, you know, rental voucher yeah. programs, uh, money for buy downs. There've been home rehab programs. So I've seen, you know, any number of communities around the region really invest a significant amount of their fund, of their community preservation funds in affordable housing efforts in a lot of uh, creative ways. So I think um, locally. Uh, a number of towns have really res responded and, and been really proactive in terms of affordable housing. But and you know the casino bill has the provision in it now for um, a certain percentage of those monies to go to the community preservation funding because the funding has dropped so significantly. Right. On, the, on the state match the, side. Yeah, right. on the state match. Right. This would allow an increase in the state match. So that was one of the pluses, I well, guess plus, you would plus, say, yeah, in the casino. Plus, 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 plus. Okay. That's a plus that we need. You know. Unfortunately, that's been the history of you know, each. The federal government used to have all pretty much sole responsibility for creating affordable housing. They, in the early 80s, devolved that to the states, and now it's getting pushed down to localities, which you know, know the needs perhaps better, but have typically less resources. But again, the community preservation funds, I've been really impressed with what any number of towns have been doing. So. What we need to do is take that safety net responsibility that's been thrown down to the you know, thrown down to the local level, is to pick it up and have it you know, and attach it to some of the federal responsibility. We we're, we're in crisis in many areas, but again, if we create a job, where is somebody going to live based upon the kind of you know kind of uh, income you know, that's available? And you think about Open Cape, you know, next year, mm -hmm. well, 2013. If it is going to be creating jobs, then where are people going to live? Yeah, and right. they're going to want more rental units. Yeah. Right. They're not going to be interested in home ownership. What, what do you think the prospects are for creating more garden apartments on Cape Cod? Because that seems to be the... I've always felt that that was a promising area in terms of, you know, let's see, efficient use of space, mm -hmm. development of village centers, and, you know, and, uh, and, and creating 
uh, I'd say centers not only commercial activity but also you know, continuing residential activities. Yeah, uh, I think we're trying to move in that direction. Bill. In fact, I met with somebody yesterday who was looking at a, a vacant office space in, in Mashpee and talking about converting that to rental apartments. And I I've been surprised I haven't seen or heard of more of that. I suppose it's just between the economy and people can't get financing for much of anything nowadays. But I think there are, clear, there are opportunities, I think, in some of, of that area. I think we, we're, we are moving, you know, commission and everybody's really looking at where it makes sense to develop and really encouraging this use kind of development. So hopefully that will be sort of our pattern going forward and how we do this. Well, as strip malls get abandoned, you know, uh, it did take them a long time to convert the one that was, uh, you know, opposite Shaw's and uh, Star and, and Howard. Yeah. But uh, that seemed to be the only, you know, reasonable conversion. So mm -hmm. there needs to be more, you know, looking at that. Yeah. We, we, we need to fill up spaces because we certainly have people that need to go to some decent and affordable place to live. Period. Well, well, did you have anything else to ask? No, about? that was... Thank you. Well, great, great. job. And, Thank and, you all. Um, yeah. And Paul's very loved down the Outer Cape. He's had successes <laughs> down there. And, yeah, they're always dragging him down with those successes. And, so... Um, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Booster, which is close by. I know. Yeah. Well, it is yeah. close by, but still, it's um, you've done great stuff down in the Toro area. And, uh, well, yeah. 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 So, okay. Good. Thank well, you, thank you well. again. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, we have about a half hour before Paul was supposed to come in. Perhaps we could do some oh, of our duty right. here. We will do duties. Yes. Um, do you have any questions with regards to the uh, <coughs> summary of items? No, I'll move the summary of items. Okay, is there a second? Uh, second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So I just know in there will be the congratulations letters to the select. Persons. Yes. No, yes. Actually, town councilors. And town councilors, yeah. 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 And I signed the ones for the Lyme Disease Task Force. So yes, thank you. That was the other one. I was trying to remember what else we needed to send yep. out. And I met Maggie Geist, and we sent her a letter on her yep. exiting, her and she yeah. said it was a great letter, and thank you so much. So, um, yep. although maybe still around. <laughs> yeah. 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 More than ever. Yeah, everybody's still around. Yeah, everybody's still around. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, well, let's see, this is like Hotel California. You can leave, but you can never check out. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Um, you, know, you can check out, but you can never leave. You know. Okay. Uh, do you want to take, uh, is there anything you wanted to? I have uh, three things, and I'm not trying to remember what they are. Oh, uh, first thing. Um, uh, results on the NACO prescription drug discount card again, mm -hmm. showing strong performance. We had a total of 2,400 um, uh, uses of the card for a total savings of $33,000. So that's really good. That's an average of 27%. I'll give you that bill. I know you can kind of talk about that. So, And I, you can also kind of compare it um, uh, month to month. So you have that one as well there. Um, I did want to mention that um, we paid the license plate, um, the third installment of the three-year license plate grant to the commission for their um, um, economic development activities. Um, so that's 350000 That was the third and final installment. We, you guys approved the marketing piece uh, last week or the week before to pay the marketing bills for the... Chamber of Commerce, who coordinates that. And so once you do both of those things, the fund balance is at its lowest point that it's ever sort of been. It's really? about 50000 So, yeah. So I just saw the October results for the revenues for the license plate. They were about 24000 And so they've been down a little bit. I think mm -hmm. we're seeing an impact on the, the economic economy on the license <coughs> plate activity. So we're at one point, I would have said we're bringing in 450, 500. It's definitely less than that at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So you guys on the on the uh, EDC, sort of going forward, you'll have to kind of face that more tight economic reality. I think, I think um, um, the, uh, what are I trying to say? The, the marketing group that, uh, that one of the members is on the EDC, Paul. Yeah. Paul Rummel. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, they had been tracking that. And he gave a report about two months ago on where the license plates were going. And mm -hmm. they were trending down, yeah. but it didn't seem to be a significant downturn. I would have said but that. 
until before recently. until the last couple of months. I remember were a little bit lower than I'm like. Mm. Yeah. Usually, you if you're in the 45 range, which is what I look like, look at, then you'll see a couple of months that are less than a mm -hmm. half or so, and then the last two have been half, the mm -hmm. 24 range. Yeah. So then you're kind of uh oh. Right. And then when I looked at, you know, Joanne had processed the the fund balance transfer for the monies. Mm -hmm. She actually said, "Do you want me to do that now, or wait till we get a little more revenue in, because the fund balance is coming down." Quite a bit. And I said, no, do it, but I'll make people aware that yeah. my balance is getting. Well, Just mine comes budget. up in January, so you'll have mine to count. Okay. <laughs> Good. So there's another $25. Another $50. Yeah, dollars. yeah I think that we get half. Oh, you get I don't half think the state mm -hmm. keeps half of it. Well, anyway. And then out of that, out of the half, uh, then uh, we split up three ways, right? Yeah, and then out of the half, it's split, yeah, three yeah. ways. Yeah. And, um, but there's more competition now because I understand there's another one that's been introduced. Uh, uh, Baby well, boomers. Well, I don't. I, I have, I have to tell you the truth. Haven't they done I, I don't want to have a target put on my back saying I'm an old person. Follow me home, you know. So I hope that they continue to keep an eye on you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a period there where sort of everybody and their brother had a plate you know, coming out. But the Bruins so have a plate. The Celtics yeah. have a plate. Red Sox yeah. have a plate. You know, the only one when we sort of came out was the right way. The the whale plate was the mm -hmm. only other one. Now there's. There are quite a few, but I think the good news is, is in terms of sales, ours has maintained a pretty high mm -hmm. level. It's probably one of the most popular, if not the most popular, play in the state. So that's good. And then, just so you know, there is um, a couple of things happening today. The assembly is meeting, and the special commission is meeting. At 6 30. So. And the MEPA review water. with a peer review. And oh, you guys are doing at one yeah, at your 1 o'clock mm -hmm. uh, at it's Barnesville Town Hall. Hall. Right. right. So. And tomorrow, <coughs> there is a meeting at the Plymouth Public Library yes. on the regional, the new regional funds that are available. So oh, 4. the, uh, $4 million. The $4 million. I remember that's right. the, the mm -hmm. governor. Governor Murray. Governor Murray. Lieutenant Governor Murray. <coughs> mentioned that that's and right. said that the county was ineligible, unfortunately, unless we paired. You can't apply, the, although the commission so is a regional planning agency, <coughs> as Margo mentioned, so right. we're, we're all set. Yeah. Yeah, I did appreciate, and I said that to uh, former Commissioner O'Leary, former Senator O'Leary, he mentioned that to them. And yes, that's Sort that of, that's good. been part of the issues kind of counties have had with the state, is no they're not recognized, and they, the state really should have a partnership. They haven't even recognized us. by the MMA. That's correct. Well, I think we're the only real viable county left. I mean, you have Franklin County, which is a cog. And the others are really territorial. Well, we do have Norfolk. Um, oh, yeah, there's you know, Norfolk. Excuse me, Dan calls me all Dan the time. would kill me right now. Yes, he will. So I apologize, Dan. <laughs> Bristol. So, uh, well, I must yes. not get carried away. Yeah, we won't well, get carried know, away. I know how relevant we are by the invitations I don't get. That's and right, exactly. Rather than the ones I get. I right. figure, gee, you don't okay. really know that we're right. here? Let's put it this way. There's none others out there with a $25 million operating budget. That is right. definitely sure. Right. MMA has recognized us in a way because after seven years of being on a committee up there, they finally put me put my name in the book last year. So there's been some faint praise as far as, as, far as because of participation, but it's a a, a long road. Yeah, it's an uphill battle. You know, that's for sure. really have to yeah. fight for recognition. But I think that we need to be visible up there in order to in order to work with the communities that you know that we're trying to help. And, and I think the good news is, and it's shown by the Lieutenant Governor's appearance at that committee, there is a recognition, I think, at all levels of the state that right. down here in Cape Cod we do have a viable regional government. So that's, that's good. That, that is true. You don't want to die. Bite the hand that feeds us. So uh, did, uh, so did you have anything else? Uh, that's all I have. Okay, did, uh, how about uh, you folks? Did you have anything you want yes, to talk about? Um, where shall I begin? Uh, on Monday evening, there was the Arts Foundation. Um, I was asked to be on the grant committee, which turned out to be an incredibly uh, great experience. There was a oh, wonderful. I think we've all done that. Now. Yeah, it's yeah. it was a room full of people that and it was the conversation. Everyone, we had forty nine uh, grants to review. Mm -hmm. Everyone came prepared. Everyone had really. It was a great discussion. And um, a lot of deliberation, a lot of thoughtfulness was put into those, uh, into the decisions. 
So the award night was in Wellfleet um, Monday evening <coughs> at the, our new preservation hall. So it was a great event. And Dan and Sarah Peak were there, Representative Peak, and uh, Senator Dan Wolf, among as well as a lot of other people who we always have to. And you know, it's amazing how people say, "You know, it took us 45 minutes to get here." Well, really, <laughs> for a change, yeah. it works but, every time. Uh, yeah, I know it does. And. Um, <laughs> But it was really a, a lovely evening and very well done. Uh, Kevin Howard did a great job, uh, and he's doing a very fine yeah. job, I think. And he even handled that grant committee. Uh, he just gave parameters and kind of stepped back and let everyone work it out. Um, so it was what kind of? Well, there was you know there was uh, they are split into uh, different categories. One is um, individuals, nonprofits. Uh, and then there's the larger organizations that you wouldn't consider arts, non-profit. Um, like there was one that went to the Alzheimer's um, Foundation to do memory mm -hmm. um, memory courses and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of poetry came through, proposals for poetry. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, poetry, I mean, I know this from my daughter, it really is resonating with young people today because it's a way to... You know, you can go with hip hop or rap or you know whatever, but it's a way to really express yourself, and and it's being taught differently than just you know meter and you know prose, and it's um it's I really have a great. Pentameter. Yes, thank you. That's I'm trying to remember. That, I had so. one my the race. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. It's not all that race. anymore so much, but it's uh but there was a grant given to the veterans uh, for peace because they produce a booklet which they gave me one from last year, and it was such a success. So I just want to say Poetry is a Peace, and um, it's, it's uh, a collection of poetry from students all across on war, on peace, on loss. So Ooh. it's really an excellent production. We'll have to get yeah. you to uh, that, and it's, they're wonderful poems. So uh, those were the types of things that were, you know, school projects, and it just made me feel better about our support with this program. And um, there's some really very dedicated people across the Cape. Bourne was able to get one for um, a historical uh, cultural grant. Um, the Af um, Mount Zion African American Museum got one to do uh, a cultural. Um, uh, so that's the one on Main Street. The one on Main Street and Hyann, right? uh, or North Street. It's North Street and Hyannis, mm -hmm. isn't it? Well, anyway, it's in Hyannis. Was John Reed there? Yes, John Reed okay. came and accepted it, and uh, it's for it's to explore the culture of Cape Verdeans. So there was a lot of great, um, great uh, projects, and uh, you know, love got to meet all these wonderful people and teachers, and um, so that was a great thing. I also was with the National Seashore, I sit on that advisory, and as always, it's very interesting, and there is so much that we uh, have. We work with the, the seashore. I see that uh, the National Seashore is supporting the uh, the cottages. Well, we are supporting. The, I was on that subcommittee, and um, we can't come up with a, at least a uh, a proposal that they be left until at least the end of next summer. Mm -hmm. They have their 300th anniversary. It's so far into it; they have to wait for the keeper to uh, if he's going to designate a historical district or not. So that kind of takes up the time of this, you know, then it will get to be too stormy to do anything about them. And by that time, the nicer weather, so let's, but it's up to George. So that was our advice, and uh, we'll see how, how it uh, lands. Because it's not just him, he has to go with his superiors. Um, and uh, there was a few other things I've done, and I know I'm going to bring it back because I, I have to, um, I was just going through this. Okay, I'll come back to it. I know that there was um, two other pieces that I did on Friday and um, uh, and over the weekend, but I can't. Well, there was Let me the look at my veteran, calendar. There was a veterans uh, event on Friday. I did not go to the veterans event on Friday, and I was unable to make the Hyannis event for that soldier. There was all, everybody came down, the governor came down. <coughs> and I also, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like, I don't know, it, it might be nicer to send a note after. But, um, um, there certainly was all of that, but there were a couple of other things. I'll look at my calendar and I will come back. So, Pat, you can take it from there. Well, actually, no, I, uh, you were sick. 
I was off with town meeting last week. Oh, so yeah, that's right. In a whole different world. But um, I did attend the veterans services in Falmouth, which were unbelievable this year. There were a thousand people there. Really? Yeah. I mean, every year it has grown and grown and grown. But this year, of course, they did uh, do a special memorial stone for Matt Gallagher, That's Sergeant right. Gallagher. They, I, th I think now there were pictures in the paper. Is they think it's a homicide, uh, then I as saw opposed that, yeah. to just well, they call it a non-combat injury. But that was a very special um, presentation of the stone too, and you know the helicopter. They do a helicopter from the base flies over, and it was really very lovely. Mm -hmm. And so I, I couldn't get over the number. Of, of course, it brought in all the networks, television, Channel Four, and Five, and Nesson, and all of that. It's good that they're because, recognizing uh, the sacrifice that you know, you know, yeah. our kids are making mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. I remember my other two items. Um, the other one is I met with uh, Brenda Bolin and Seth Rolbein, who is the district aide for Senator Wolf. Uh, actually, they came to my house yesterday because we gave we put in a call, a conference call to to um, Secretary Arbach's office, which is he is the secretary of the Department of Public Health, uh, because we're they're putting together a commission, a special commission on Lyme disease up at the state house. Mm -hmm. Um, again, the Cape has, is the lead on that because we have done more work than everyone. Uh, at one time, we used to get a hundred thousand dollars that was actually put in as a line item or earmark when earmarks existed. Um, back with Senator Rauschenbach, that has since discontinued. So there's a lot of education piece, a lot of education uh, for physicians that we can't do. So we were just wondering how we can do this. So it was a good conversation with the Dr. Katie Brown and uh, Julian Sear, who is one of his aides up there. Uh, just in, in some creative ways, we could maybe um, seek other uh, funding. And um, that was a very productive conversation, even though nobody had anything, like there was no cash to offer. But there were some ways to think about things differently. Um, it does look like Brenda's uh, and Dr. Danta uh, who is her real lead guy and been very faithful to this program? They will prob. It looks they've made it past the vetting process. They're on the list, so it just has to be signed into uh, passage by the governor. It probably won't take all effect until after the new year. So, um, but I think once that commission gets into place, then we'll see uh, if there's money collectively. But I do think what they're saying is. We've done a great job. We have a lot of expertise that we can offer. This is definitely um, uh, increasing across the state to the point where it's a prevalence. There is more prevalence across the state as there is across the New England area. So where we were really the main hotspot, it's changed uh, and it's, it's growing. So there's more demand. Uh, and less resources. I hope there's so, more recognition. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, somewhere down the road, I'm wondering if we can leverage our expertise into something yeah, I mean, with is, neighboring towns. Yeah, this is one of those opportunities yeah. that kind of came up with it, it, the with lieutenant, lieutenant governor about governor. doing things beyond our border. Exactly. So if we had, if we could partner with um, some towns in southwestern Massachusetts or western Massachusetts when all of this commission comes. So these were the things that we were talking about, and it was. You know, so it's hopeful for the future. And um, the other thing that um, I just added here, and it's oh, I went to the Barnstable Village um, planning uh, meeting. You know, their um, <coughs> revitalization of the village. So it's a, it's a, that was the civic associations meeting, but they have um, it is it's the civic association. Uh, the Bonsville Village Association, I mean there's four organizations that are working together for the revitalization. I uh, went because I had attended one meeting across the street of their leadership with Patty Daly. Patty Daly is in working with Joanne Buntage now. We did talk about the parking lot, the signage. There are plans. They, would, they do want to talk to us about our plans going forward. So. Mm -hmm. Before there's more plans going on up at the hill, I would like to be able to maybe, I think it's time that we have a meeting and really kind of think things through before we use all that space and see if there's other, uh, w other uses we can make of it and uh, some that will be beneficial to us and some that will be beneficial to the town. 
I would so. hope that we'd include Ann Kennedy. In the and Ann Kennedy, of course, was there. And if, you know, I was very happy to congratulate her on her because she is a, a dedicated representative to to um, to the village. I mean, she, like it's the only village in the five villages. So. Um, uh, so that was a very interesting meeting. They had the gentlemen that were uh, that are taking over the <coughs> that bought the building store across right. the street, the general store. Uh, so it's a it's the people the people who are going to run it are the um, managers of Fancy's and Peterson's. Fancy's a great operation. It's a great operation. So they're they're more gourmet and sort of uh, specialty items. Peterson's is more of a supermarket. They're going to combine the two. They're talking with Tim Friary about doing their as much produce as they can locally. Um, they're going to be looking at local artisans. Very much about the idea of what I was thinking. We could have done if we, you know, if we wanted to buy that building. I actually thought it considered we should maybe think about Remember, buying the building. Remember, we're the dreaded public sector. I know, but we could have farmed it out. You know, we could have leased it to a to these to to managers such as this, and and brought more of a buy local theme to it. So. Um, uh, and I think they're going along those lines. Uh, everyone is very, very excited. The um, landlord who owns now the village landing, the post office buildings that are adjoined to it, was there. And you know, the village landing just closed. I mean, it just kaput. <coughs> so, um, so he didn't speak, but there was lots of opportunity. You know, they were all sort of milling around talking to each other. So there's, I think, more opportunities down the road. A gentleman from Osterville is kind of the backer of this venture and he's uh, very happy that it's all going well and never felt so welcomed into a community so that was a it was a you know a feel good meeting last night was um lee, lee it was lee hill well you no know, i would i had told them i would go and i lost the whole calendar oh, in my phone right. so for for like two weeks i had right. no idea where i was supposed to right. be but they were happy to see the, the, the county there that was and uh, and um I just want to make a, a, this is sort of a personal thing, um, but it is also to Barnstable Village. Um, Sheila Burse, uh, I guess that it's B-A-R-S-E, so I can say Burse, Beers, um, is a real estate agent over at Kilman Grove over here. And um, I met her when I was looking at different properties some years ago, and uh, she she reached out and was really a friend to me in this, when I was a new delegate in this area, when I was a stranger in a strange town in a way, and um, she just continued to be a great friend. She sits over there, a lot of people dropped in on her. She was great at matching people to people, people to houses. And uh, I was told last night that she uh, passed away very suddenly at her desk, basically, okay. over across the street. And, you know, Sheila's one that walked every day. <coughs> and so, it, to me, I, I think she was... Uh, a great community person. Uh, she knew everybody in Barnstable Village. She loved Barnstable Village. And uh, I felt very, very um, sad. And, and uh, it's a, a loss to me, but uh, I think a loss to the community. So I just wanted to mention that. It was, um, um, yeah, I was, I, was, I was upset to hear that. And was there any, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say about the village. For the stroll, do we participate? I know that the commission, and I'm going to give a heads up, I mean, they decorate over there, but they would really, and I know that we decorate some, but they're really trying to make it as festive as possible. So Yeah, in the past we've opened the building. If okay, we, that's I right. Okay, we do all of that know, stuff. Okay. I just, in the building I just wanted to make sure, yeah. And and people use it for bathrooms. Splash, yes. Yeah, so we've done different things. Splash yeah. with lights and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, because they really make it. They haven't contacted too. me. I no, they haven't. They're just in the process okay. of doing that. So the woman who does the uh, coordination of that will be. Um, yeah. They're just they're just getting all of that sure. that geared away. So okay, that will be. People should know that there is a public bathroom over the fire station. That's usually right. that's yeah. happened. Yeah. yeah. Right. But yeah, you get we. If they want us to open the building, we usually open. The building. And they thought the the general store would be open by January first. They're of course being held up with certain mechanical contracting schedules, so they're still shooting for that. But they did say that they would have it all decorated and they would um, serve cocoa and even if they have people standing outside. So they're they're geared to be neighbors and you know that sort of thing. So that's I think all I have to report. Okay. Well, uh, did you ever hear this?
Okay, I, 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 I lost my, I'm telling you, I lost my talent. So I would have been there, okay. and I no problem. remember it. Friday, there was a much lower, let's say, smaller scale uh, you know, uh, veterans activity over at Island Pond, the, at the uh, Veteran Memorial over there. But it was very nice, uh, and it seems like you, know, you see the same people. You know, about, there's about 100 people that show up, and uh, mm -hmm. we, we sort of, in the Boy Scouts, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, do, they, they, uh, they do all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Monday, uh, let's see, we had another meeting of uh, the uh, Special Commission. Was that before last Wednesday? Yes, uh, it was Wednesday. Thursday. It was Thursday, Thursday. Thursday. that's Thursday, right, right, when yeah. the right, when the Lieutenant Governor came. The Lieutenant Governor came, and uh, I, I think that the only concern that I had of all of his comments was his continuing mention of the Franklin Council of Governments as being the criteria by which regional government should be based, and they are not a regional government. I the other part, the other piece I that I'm very concerned with, because we have such a great opportunity to provide a partnership beyond the regional planning activities that we already do, and we already enjoy participation, uh, perhaps he needs to have some education with regard to the things that the state is already participating in, so we could leverage that to other things that we could do to, let's say, to complete and make a full partnership. Uh, but overall, I, I did appreciate the fact that you know, that he did come and you know uh, to to visit with us, and that uh, I thought it was at the end. At the end, I thought there was a lot of a great uh, candid exchange of information. It was. And it was very useful. It was very very useful, and I regretted that that wasn't taped actually because it was it was great questions, and and as this special commission is going forward, you know you can see they're probably feeling more a sense of. Where they where they may go or what what their whole journey is about, so their questions I find are becoming even much more poignant, thoughtful. Fortunately, they are taking minutes, and uh, and, and those should those were extensive. Yeah, the ones that I just received. I didn't know they were taking minutes. Yeah, uh, yes, and they were Marilyn very. Yeah, your former employee. Yeah, yeah Marilyn Lopes is, uh, is right there. <laughs> Almost word for word. I mean, she's yeah, she's really. A, I, I wish I had done. known that she before I spoke. Two things about that. There's two things. One of those is a state philosophy. That's yeah, well, philosophy. we have it down on the record now. Going yeah. forward is kind of intermunicipal agreements or this voluntary mm -hmm. kind of, you know, uh, association of, of municipalities. Which is really what the COG is. Yeah. Like exactly. exactly. But the, there's a reason for that, and that's sort of where there are, isn't a county. That's the only mechanism formally that's out mm -hmm. there. And that was in the abolishment statute, you remember going back yeah. to 97, mm -hmm. abolished all counties, and then at the very end it gave you this mechanism to reform if you wanted into a council mm -hmm. of government. So right. that's really the only formal alternative that's out there in right. Mass General. In, 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 I went, you know, I talked to the co-chairs and stuff and asked the question you did, like, this. <laughs> and they just thought he was being more politically um, sensitive to both sides of that issue, so. Um, it wouldn't have hurt him if he remembered where he was. Shh, now be nice. Right. I think he did. Where did he think he was? Yeah. No. Right here. <laughs> um, okay, uh, the, um, <laughs> we had the, uh, um, uh, yesterday we had the uh, Human Service uh, meeting in, in the town of Barnstable, and we had a very, we had a great uh, presentation by Ray Tomasi, uh, on uh, su uh, the, the the thing that that committee is pursuing is substance abuse issues. Yes. And uh, we now have heard from uh, uh, from uh, let's see, the Boston committee. We heard from Ray Tomasi yesterday, and uh, the next uh, will be somebody from law enforcement you know, talking about it. You know, they're looking at at the elements of uh, education, uh, family involvement, uh, the. Uh, in the uh, economic issues, you know, that are connected to it, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, enforcement issues as to how to put that all together. <laughs> and although it's focused on specifically in the town of Barnstable, I think at the end uh, there will be a product that uh, we pre perhaps could, you know, could leverage and, and put in other places. Uh, after that, uh, I went to my housing authority meeting, and uh, at, you know, at that meeting, you know, we, we are very concerned with regard to what's going on at the state because DHCD has not. It's been several months. We have not be appointed or appointed someone to take mm -hmm. Tina, uh, Tina Brooks place, and that's a very crucial piece that's uh, that's missing in terms of progress with regard to that. After that, uh, I went to uh, the town of Yarmouth, board of selectmen. There was a workshop, 
excuse me, is a presentation by the Cape Line Compact with regard to questions uh, on uh, <coughs> on decisions that were made with regard to municipal uh, uh, power supply purchase. And the point that, uh, and by the way, Maggie was brilliant. She was absolutely brilliant. It was, it was a wonderful presentation. And it pointed out that the decisions that were made with regard to what the town of Yarmouth and the town of Barnesville did were decisions that were made uh, with the consultation of their own consultant, and that uh, they did not uh, they did not elect to follow the recommendation uh, that uh, Cape Light Compact had made, which is to take a shorter let's say a shorter interval on power purchase. They chose to take a longer interval on power purchase. Uh, the, and, and you can understand why they did that, because you have to have some predictability with regard to going forward. Uh, the outcome in the short term is that the, the shorter interval uh, voted better for uh, the uh, you know, Cape Lake Compact consumers because the rate was lower, and uh, in terms of the contract that they committed to, you know, the rate was higher. But that was the decision that was made based upon uh, an issue of stability. I was happy to see that uh, Bill Hinchy, uh, who was there, the new uh, town manager, uh, said at the end that he had supported that decision in Chatham and would have supported it in Yarmouth. So I thought that that was a, that, that was a very good thing to, you know, thing to say. I did pursue another thing last night with regard to, uh, in the pursuit of regional issues, I heard before we got, before we got on, the town of Yarmouth mentioned several times how important it was to get involved with regional issues. They mentioned several times how important AmeriCorps has been to, uh, let's say, uh, making a significant contribution within the town as far as you know, things that are going on there. And, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I said that we were ready to go forward and pointed out how important it was to integrate the information that their former town manager, Bob Lawton, had suggested with regard to organization and that the town managers throughout the, throughout the uh, Cape were a source of, let's say, of uh, actually accomplishing objectives since the town managers not only had to put the budget together, uh, but after it had been approved uh, on a policy basis, were responsible for, you know, let's say, for, uh, for making sure that, they, you know, that the variance was you know, limited and managed it properly. So anyway, I thought it was a, a, it was a wonderful visit as far as, uh, you know, it, although it was just on Cape Light Compact, I thought that uh, everything you know, went, to, you know, went well together. And uh, we were certainly well represented by, you know, by Maggie Downey with regard, and Joe Soros, you know, who was also there. Uh, the, uh, uh, ironically, when Peter Kenny got up to speak, he supported everything that Maggie said to a great degree. And, Maggie, and then, Maggie, then Maggie said, "Well, I find myself in total agreement with, uh, you know, with, uh, with what Peter is saying." So, anyway. He also so, said nice things about the commission at the special commission meeting, which was astounding. <laughs> so, can I, before you progress. move on to your next thing, and I'll excuse myself, uh, just a reminder, there's no meeting next week, so everybody have a happy Thanksgiving. Oh, and yeah. happy Thanksgiving. And, and, uh, so I'll, you and I guess we'll work on the agenda for the meeting yeah. after that, uh, assuming it's the 30th, so. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, can I just tell one more thing? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I did uh, attend, speaking of suicide and um, just substance abuse, I was asked by Chris Carbone, uh, I don't know if I said Carbone, I think that's my name, Carbonelli, uh, down, she works with the Outer Cape people, and uh, she asked me to attend a substance abuse um, meeting and even maybe be the elected official on their board. And... Um, the, the woman that they had speak, um, you know, you're talking about socioeconomic and all different all different factors, but we all know substance abuse uh, knows no, none of those factors. Um, everything done right, beautiful daughter, raised, you know, with everything, BC uh, college, and um, somewhere in there got OxyContin. It was at a party or whatever, and very quickly, and in a very brief period of time became very addicted knew she was in trouble, called her parents, went to addiction, you know, went to a rehab, kept a, a detailed diary. It was very emotional. They spent Christmas Day together. Uh, everything looked like it was going well. And the next morning they were called to say she had overdosed. Somebody had it there. It was, you know, holidays. And um, this was a tragic 
event, but what struck me was that this was not a a problem a problem that had occurred from way in the beginning. I guess you know there was a little bit of experimenting in high school or what have you, but um, you know probably marijuana. Uh, but but here was something that got a hold of her very quickly and dug in so deep. And in her diary, she talks about how she felt like her body was taken over and how she felt like she lost herself and she was trying to find herself again. And it was very emotional and, you know, your heart just broke for these parents. But um, how dangerous these drugs are uh, in, in, um, and how quickly they can take a hold. So I think all parents and people who are facing pain management have to be very careful about what they're being given and what they take. And uh, it's really, it was a very sad problem. So I'll be working with the other cake on Okay, so. well, Rachel Massey made the point that, uh, you know, specifically about OxyContin, yeah. was that the, there was a change in the matrix which accelerated the effect because it is a time release type of drug. Right. But if you change the matrix and you have that acceleration, you do have the hit. Yeah. Uh, he also pointed out how important it was for families to get out of denial with regard to looking at let's say specific examples of deterioration of behavior so that's that you know that's another piece that uh, that is part of the education piece to engage and involve the family one of the areas of legislation that I think we need to think about is that because of the concern about uh, privacy there is a um, there is a separation between someone when they magically turn 18 or 19 years old that the, the a parent can no longer get information with regard to, you know, regard to uh, the kid because they're identified as an adult, and that's terrible. It's unbelievable. With, because the parent and the family is expected to take a lead role with regard to supporting the, you know, the uh, rehabilitation of, you right. know, the child. So we need to, we need to have some intelligence on that in yeah. order to, in, let's say, in order to resolve it successfully. So when you get on that, com you know, committee, I think that, that w that's one thing. That, it's a very good point. It's an know. other un unintended consequence. And I know that I went to pick up um, a prescription for my daughter, and uh, yeah, they asked you how old you were. Yeah, I had a, I, I, they had a call for permission. Well, actually, I was getting some. Stuff, <laughs> I'm like, I was getting some blood pressure medication. Like for, for I'm my wife old and going to the nurse. nurse the you call me yet? <laughs> well, not enough about chatting. <laughs> That's right. We're taking. I, will, time. I have a comment to make, but I'll make it at the next. Mr. Next Chairman. Time. Okay. He has to do a tape change. There's about 20 okay. minutes left on this tape. Should we change now? Sure. Yes. Sure. Okay, we up? We are up. Okay. Uh, and now we have... Uh, Who are you? Okay. Paul Nesbucki. Mark Snow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Who's that? I've got to not say that. <laughs> Get myself in trouble. I know. <laughs> we could have too much fun now. Fun. Um, well, I don't there, think there's the point about fun. how arrogant you are and how you piss off all the developers. You know, we sort of have to get past that, right? Yes. Yes. I okay. Think we can start with that. Though. Well, probably not a bad place to start. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good place to start. Because Is it you true? know, that's it's the ups and downs mm -hmm. of the commission, and I guess that was that was something that I was thinking about. How you go through a period of, you know, there's good response and people have great things to say, and all of a sudden, what something happens. One thing happens. And then there's this little blip what that have you occurs. Done for me and I guess my question is, how do you deal with the blips like that? Especially when they when they're a little bit on the downside. Which particular blips are you talking about? Well, yeah. there's quite a few. There's a couple in the paper. Yeah, no. I can't there's remember. There's a lot of stuff that's been in the paper uh, recently. Most of it's not from developers, though. A lot of it has been critical. A lot of it surrounds the wastewater issue. It's all about the waste prevention. And so the more, um, you know, we've been. It's, it's frustrating, but the first thing I try to do, especially when it does come from uh, people that are subject to the regulatory process of the commission, is listen uh, to what the specifics of the concerns are. Because we always seek to improve. And in fact, I think that uh, when we update the regional policy plan this spring, we'll be making some changes that have been brought to our attention of just, you know, some, you draft these regulations, they're in place for 20 years, and all of a sudden parts of them tend to be uh, Inconsistent. Even if they're marginally inconsistent, you want to make sure that they match up. And so uh, we're going to make every effort to do that. Um, but on the on the wastewater side, it's uh, 
This is the biggest environmental issue that's facing the Cape, and it is the biggest capital construction project that the, this region will probably ever see, collectively speaking, in terms of uh, resources necessary. And that hits everybody. And, and you know, the funding of wastewater is different than almost any other piece of infrastructure that we deal with. Transportation money generally comes from the federal government through the state as a subgrantee to the region. Wastewater is almost exclusively paid on the backs of homeowners, households, property owners. Um, and so that amplifies the sensitivity around the issue. Um, but predictably, you know, uh, what's frustrating is that, that they seem to point at the county and suggest that, that uh, there's, there's something they don't know about. But we come in front of you all the time and tell you exactly what's going on. And, uh, you know, my position on this really started when I was still the assistant town manager in Barnstable and the first chair of the Water Protection Collaborative. My position hasn't changed in the last six years on this. You know, we need to find, we need to move towards a watershed-based solution because I'm confident that, that will produce the most effective result at the lowest possible cost. And that has always been our position. You know, at times it used to be that we would be portrayed as the county was in favor of big pipe solutions. That's never been the case. It's not the case on our website. It's not the case in any of the written documents that we propose. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that comes up is just not factual. Paul, the, the, the big pipe thing, we should put it to rest right now. When we initially went out to try to get support from the towns for the, you know, for the ancestor of the, you know, of the water protection stuff that we're doing now, that was, the, that was the thing that was brought up as an emotional reaction to say that we don't want that. And, right. and, and, and at that time, I said that's not the solution. The solution is the one that we that, that you that you followed and that I followed in terms of talking to the boards of selectmen in the beginning. There are solutions that are appropriate for subregions. Those are the ones that we will seek. It is not one size fits all. It is not Route Six is an avenue for you know for the big pipe. It is not the uh, sewage treatment plant that will go in Sandwich Hollows. It is it is a solution that's appropriate. That meets the needs in a community and is the most cost-effective and, co and let's say and efficient one that we, know we can devise. Absolutely. The watershed solution is the key to it. Yep. You contribute to something, and you know this. You contribute to something, and you're not affected by it. You have a very low motivation to support a solution. So the county provides that opportunity for the umbrella to happen, and you know, you've been our point person on that. Yeah. Well, you know, part of it is. Um, I have always expressed a concern uh, for a number of years now that the, the federal regulatory structure and the state regulatory structure are set up to deal mainly with communities that already have, have extensive infrastructure that they just haven't kept up. And they're not suited regulatory to think about regions like the Cape where only 15% of the flows and only 3% of the parcels have any sort of infrastructure associated with them, any meaningful infrastructure associated with them at all. So that's our biggest challenge. That's why the $3 billion number is so big, because it somewhat assumes this, this approach, this extensive sort of capital approach. And uh, that presents our biggest financial challenge, but it pro also provides our biggest opportunity. And what we've been trying to do for years now is to work with federal and state regulators to get them to think about different approaches in different watersheds and different technologies, and using the CAPE as a pilot program for new uh, more sustainable, less expensive ways to deal with uh, the remediation and, and, the, in, and the, uh, the remediation of, of water quality in our estuaries and veins. And, I, and they're starting to listen. Uh, so I think we've advocated for that position since the beginning, and it seems to be opposite of what a lot of what I read uh, in the paper. I mean, some of what I've read for the, from the Outer Cape is just uh, rumor and innuendo, and I, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm naive, but I'm surprised they even printed it. Uh, <laughs> and some of it I had never heard before I read the words in the paper. Other uh, parts of it from more of the Upper Cape have been uh, criticism of the litigation and our involvement in the litigation. The fact of the matter and the facts uh, that are in evidence um, are that we were given a notice of intent to sue last August. We responded in October with a very vigorous defense uh, of our position that we were not necessarily the, a culpable party here, uh, and a defense of the towns and in addressing some sort of the, the cost issues. So we're on record with that. That's always been our position. We have been invited to uh, participate in, in certain discussions because we have 
information that's better than state information and better than what the feds have on the region. And you know the MEP is part of that, and there's the, the group is meeting today. That's the review panel, and they're going to make their announcement at one about what the last three days has has been like for them, and that's an important step going forward. But what a lot of people don't recognize is that MEP program is the biggest cost savings tool that we've had to date because it has primarily been sponsored by the state and the county in many respects with municipal contributions also. But that has allowed us to come up with tailored total maximum daily loads that will allow us to build less infrastructure. If we didn't have that regulation in place and the feds and the state went into enforcement, we would definitely be overbuilding more conventional systems. So that, that has an opportunity to reduce costs up front. The other aspects of some of the criticism I've heard uh, read in the paper lately has to do with sort of our involvement uh, in the fact that we're, we're not uh, as yet, defendants in a lawsuit, and uh, you know, that sort of rubs me the wrong way uh, in in many respects. Because <coughs> we're not talking about some slip and fall outside of the superior courthouse uh, where you get something in the mail and you ignore it until somebody brings you in a, into court. We have a responsibility, and you know, Bill and I we've we've discussed this. The reason why the county is a target is because if you know anything about the the, uh, the claim. They're not looking to towns as culpable uh, parties in this, for the most part. They are looking to property owners as culpable parties. And there's only one governmental entity that represents every single property owner on the Cape, and you're it. You know, and you got, you're the only people that are elected at large to represent all of those people. And the only way we can meet that responsibility is to actively provide visibility <coughs> for support for something that protects those properties. Exactly. And, yeah, and so when we're invited to mediation, for example, along with the state, who is also not named as a defendant the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, and the suggestion is, well, we can either litigate or mediate. I'm going to choose mediate. You know, I don't want to be a defendant. I don't want to be sued. And so I'm going to participate as fully as I can at every opportunity uh, so that that doesn't happen. And so that there's somebody at the table with information saying, you have to pay attention to costs here. And we don't want federal permits on Cape Cod. And that's what we've been advocating from the beginning. So, yeah, I mean, you read this stuff in the paper, and it's so um, devoid of, of uh, factual information and competent legal analysis. It's well, frustrating. Actually, today, for example, the point that they say that we have, are suggesting that we have the ability to raise money you know, by, you know, by imposing a tax is not true. It is not available to us. Absolutely not available. The, the culpable... And this is the, the other part that really frustrates me about the potential litigation is obviously Conservation Law Foundation and the Buzzes Bay Coalition mentioned in their notice of intent to sue a specific action where they felt the Cape Cod Commission was liable. And it was one of a number of things that they could put in a complaint. Now, um, when people question that, my only de defense would be to tell people how we might be culpable. But now why would I do that in a public <laughs> forum? Right. Uh, so, do I have concerns that the Cape Cod Commission has some liability? I mean, just answering that question is almost inviting a lawsuit. Excuse me, you are an attorney, aren't you? I am. And you are admitted to the bar of Massachusetts? I certainly am, and, and I hope you're not standing stupid. For so, we've, been, we've analyzed all of this, but there, the specific claim in the, in the Notice of Intent to Sue re is, regards the Clean Water Act uh, Chapter 208 planning process. And it refers to a 1978 plan. And, you know, I was 14, so I don't take a lot of responsibility for the 78 plan. But there's ongoing responsibilities with that program, and the EPA looks at that program differently in other spots. What I can say is that the threat of federal permitting on the Cape is not imagined. You know, it's not hyperbole. It's actually been a precedent in other cases around uh, the country. And if you look at just Chesapeake Bay and Lake Champlain, for example, you can see the Conservation Law Foundation's involvement in both of those cases. And in the state of Vermont case for Lake Champlain, it's the first time that total maximum daily loads have been set for a water body approved by EPA. And then you have a federal judge comes, coming in and saying, no, we're going to send them back this time. We're going to decertify TMDLs that have been certified by EPA because they weren't stringent enough. And so EPA has now taken that discretion away from the state of Vermont, and they're working on the TMDLs themselves. If that's not an exact blueprint 
for what's happening here to us, I don't know what is. So the people that think that this is somehow imaginary or there's some mythology associated with this, you know, I know there's a lot of sand on the cape, but that doesn't mean we all have to bury our head in it. I mean, there, there is a real concern here. There has been for six years. and uh, Longer than that. Yeah, and we have been trying to defend against that. I mean, the kinds of, if you look at a, the, the action of a federal judge or the action of the EPA in the settlement of, of this suit, or the, or the available tools that DEP might be forced in a state action, because this is only one action, there, you know, I mean, I hesitate to say this, but there are other potential actions that are floating out there. Uh, and so all of this is coming at us. It would be foolish to turn our back and say, shrug, and shrug our shoulders and say, it's not our problem. Because I don't think that that's factual, I don't think it's accurate, and I think it's recklessly irresponsible. And uh, it's just difficult for me to answer uh, publicly without making the case for potential plaintiffs against us as we work as hard as we can with the tools that we have to try to solve this problem. Just to piggyback on that, when we had our conversation with regard to next steps, because you know I was greatly concerned about what happened in Yama, yeah. uh, the, I think that, you know, since we're talking about your goals, one of the, the goals that could be, that is, would be incorporated in one of the ones that have been presented is to, is to pursue that focus group idea that you had. The, yeah. the only thing that I think is important to be an element in that, uh, besides the, you know, the, 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 what the people need to hear to offset the, the cost, is to have some positive thing is what what can we identify as the prime motivation of people to support it? So, yeah. so somehow or other, no, we, those two pieces have to come together, in my opinion. Yeah. And, we, and we've talked, and I know that you, you have, uh, um, you know, I think you're, you're sort of running out of patience on, on but our, our approach on the county level today hasn't been to move independently. It's been to support the local plans moving forward. And we've done that in Chatham. The Cape Cod Commission has reviewed the Chatham CWP, and we've reviewed the Orleans and accepted the, the Orleans CWP. We advocated on town meeting floor for Yarmouth. We didn't advocate in Barnstable because, you know, or in some of the initial discussions, uh, because of the 100% betterment approach, which you know didn't uh, was not something that we could necessarily get behind. Um, but we have advocated for these local approach. But I, what I saw is what I knew. What happened in Yarmouth is uh, this is starting to become become unaffordable. Uh, the the discussion because there isn't. Because it's a top-down approach, you know, everybody recognizes that we have a problem. It, you don't have to be here for more than a generation to understand that the water quality is significantly degraded. But you know, my kids and uh, you know other children out there now, they're used to the way it is now. And if we don't very quickly get to the point where we start to remediate that water quality, this is all they're ever going to know, and we're going to lose a generation of of awareness. And we will have failed as stewards of this peninsula moving forward. So we, ha we have an obligation to go out there, and we did it with the watershed tours last year, but that was more water information based. And it's difficult, especially in the winter, to get people to come out of their homes and, and talk about that. But it was a successful uh, project, and, and uh, I think we made a lot of uh, progress. But you can't just say, this is the problem, and then this is what's going to cost to solve the problem, and then divide it by 150,000 households or 130,000 households on the Cape. Um, that's not responsible because you know what we're we're feeding into what's been told to us is that the only appropriate uh, people to uh, to pay for this are the are the homeowners, uh, and that that can't be the approach. So what 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 we discussed, Bill, is I think in the spring. Uh, and in the early part of the summer when the second homeowners come back, we have to go out there and start talking about costs. And we need to, as a region, define what an affordable cost is, what our share of this problem is. Because we have to look at what other people in the Commonwealth pay for, for uh, uh, wastewater services. We have to make people aware of the financial liability they've got in their backyard with a Title V system. We've got to look at the EPA regulations that, that uh, go to affordability of these capital construction projects. And we've got to set the bar there. And it's going to leave a big gap. But that at least allows us to have the discussion with the state and the feds. Like, hey, listen, we've established what we're willing to pay as a region uh, to preserve this resource. You have to help us. And so we all need to get creative about how we're going to fill that gap, not on the backs of, uh, 
homeless? Well, I think that there's two pieces here. One is the year-round residents, and the other is the people who have the beneficial, let's say, application. So yeah. I think the dividing line, the base figure for division of responsibility is at the 800,000 level, not at the 230,000 level. Well, that's, that's a good point. So how do we take people that aren't property owners on the Cape, but contribute significantly to the problem? And this gets back to another quirk of the financing of wastewater that, uh, you know, we also have to overbuild our transportation system to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. In some places we don't do it very well and we deal with the, with the traffic. But on the wastewater side, we, we have a, a peak flow pricing issue. When we are building centralized collection uh, facilities and capital construction facilities, we have to build them to accommodate peak flows, which happens four weeks out of the air. Last two weeks of July, first two weeks of August. And so we're overbuilding for four weeks out of the year. Uh, and so we have to look at what, those co what the costs are associated with that and how can we sort of spread those costs. Or, for example, how can we build smarter? What they do in uh, Portland, Oregon, for example, they've got... Uh, treatment plants that treat to a lower level than tertiary treatment. Some are primary plants, some are secondary plants. But they discharge through an extensive natural system that removes uh, nutrients and, and sometimes uh, some of the heavy metals and toxins too. Um, but it can only remove it when the plants can grow. But in a seasonal community like us, that's perfect. So if we can start to offset some of the costs associated with effluent disposal, for example, or build smaller footprint plants, that can take a more natural and e more easily sustainable uh, facility, then those that's the kind of creativity that we need here. And that's the kind of relief we need from regulators in order to start to bring that number now down and make a system work and not continue to build really big pipe solutions that we know are unsustainable long term. Uh, so th that's why I think that there's a huge opportunity, but the discussion this year has to be about costs. And I think it's, it's radically important to establish for ourselves what our ability to pay is. Otherwise, you get stuck with sort of a state formula like the Education Reform Act. And they come down and tell you what they think your local burden is. And they use EQV instead of median income. And you wind up with uh, a funding formula that's completely skewed against coastal communities. And what we've been able to demonstrate to the watershed tour that the Cape uh, there are really two Cape Cods, and most of the year-round residents and the larger families live in the middle in the upper Cape, and uh, they live uh, uh, at a rate that's significantly below the median average. And they can't afford the kind of per-property costs associated with these massive construction projects. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to say that I was you know, really outraged by uh, a series of these letters, starting with uh, the My View in my in the Cape Cod Times by uh, former Representative Turkington, who not only, um, I, I find it that it gets to be very personal when people call out people's names, uh, people who are very hardworking, and then to imply that we sit here and don't know what's going on and, all, and people are running rogue behind us and, and nobody is reporting to us and we're not informed and saying, go forward. Um, I, I took real issue with that. I wanted to respond and I do think that there is a point where we do have to respond because this starts to build. We have re, we responded to the community um, request of uh, a peer review of the MEP. Um, uh, nobody came forward with money for the NAS study. We have put forward over $100,000 for this study uh, that is being um, unveiled and, and um, the, the review has taken yeah, place yeah. in there in another We're the only ones with the skin in the game. However, that we're the only ones with the skin in the game. And already, the people who were the first ones to bring this up were the people out of Orleans. They've already done about three commentaries in the paper discrediting the committee that hasn't even reported yet. Um, to me, and then the article down in the banner, and I don't know if you've seen this, but I'll be happy to send it to you, and I think that we have to discuss it, um, was uh, the delegate from Provincetown reflecting on her year gone past, and um, not only, uh, again, made it very personal by saying that there is some um, plot by um, Paul Nedzwicki uh, in the Special Commission to gain more control, and... Um, and power, and um, and there is a secret plan somewhere. Oh, yes. uh, it, it, it was about her develop. role as a delegate, which I could see that she really didn't understand. Um, to me, this is all the distraction of disinformation. Uh, this is 
this is what we are facing on the national leather level when we are brought down to be talking about pro-abortion, anti-abortion, uh, gay rights, instead of looking at the issues that we should be looking at as a nation, We're instead of personal issues. Here. I know, but this is the, it has the same impact where people are not looking at the facts. They're, they're being brought down into these, to these inconsequential conversations that really do not take in the big picture and the big information. Well, so, well I, I thank you, uh, I guess. Yeah, no, well, what I say what is I think... That, uh, I, I, what, issue in Provincetown and now broadcasting it. Uh, <coughs> well, I, well I, just want, I just want to say that, um, you know, I, I just find it outrageous. And well, uh, it wasn't, it, look, it hasn't been lost. There's a lot of people across the Cape that have brought no, this up. And I appreciate attention. that, but, but I, don't, I don't, I mean, people, I see my name all the time used in vain. Uh, or you associated with things that it are was you and it was it, it was, it was yeah. Andrew Gottlieb so, and, and you know, it, insinuating but it, things. But it doesn't. It, you know, I I don't often feel the need to respond in kind. I think it. You know, m more times it just it dignifies what uh, these kind of responses that shouldn't be dignified. Um, in the case of the Provincetown situation, that was a report made to the Provincetown Board of Selectmen. So I certainly will go to the Board of Selectmen mm -hmm. and uh, set the record straight and allow them to ask me any question that they want. Mm -hmm. And I'll stand on my reputation as always having answered those questions openly and honestly. And I don't think they'll find any inconsistency there. Um, you know, some of the other stuff is more difficult. I think you know, it's, it, it's, it, my di it's difficult for me to respond, as I explained before, about why we're not a part of the lawsuit without making some testimony as to what our legal liability might be. Exactly. So I'm going to... And that's sometimes you're just in a position where you can't respond. I understand. And that's frustrating. Um, so we will try to respond on the issues. The other thing I would just mention that in none of these articles do any of these people come forward with any solution, exactly. any sort of better way. Right. And, you know, I commend the county in taking the lead role in establishing the Water Protection Collaborative when you've got not, n n n there's no jurisdiction necessarily and putting money into the MEP uh, process. Uh, that's leadership, you know, and that's essential and it's important. But, you know, these projects, there are a thousand ways to kill them, death by a thousand cuts. There are very few ways to move them forward. Um, but the only way that works is if you do it with integrity and, and you, per, and you ex example leadership and you suffer the slings and arrows and you keep moving forward. And that's what we're going to do because I'm not afraid of any of the facts. Um, and so what we're going to try to do is just to get out there and okay. continue to promote well, the facts. Getting back to so the, that what we're really doing is your evaluation. Okay. Thank you very much. It's our, it's it's very evaluation. Interesting. I think that at this point, if we were focused on no other goal, and, and in this case it is a mutual goal, of accomplishing what has been an objective mm -hmm. and a, a priority for the every board of commissioners that I've served on since I showed up up here is that we've got to show that we can make some progress with regard to this issue. We've got to identify specific things that we can accomplish and specific, let's say, specific objectives that we're going to try to reach. And, and I would say if, if you did, in my personal opinion, if you did nothing else other than work on that area, then you would have done what the regional planning agency is supposed to do and then anything that comes in underneath of that would have, would have a sort of a secondary place. But to me, there is no more important issue than winning the hearts and minds of the people that are here to support what we're trying to offer, which is a management plan, a, a way of implementing the strategies that we talked about, and delivering the protection that we're supposed to, and that we that I think we all were elected. To, let's say, to provide you know, for the people that are here. And can, can I just say one other thing on this? Um, in talking about you know getting that information to the various groups, uh, residents and non-residents, you know the summertime is when all of the non-resident taxpayer associations have their meetings, and um, it might be beneficial to get that schedule and really get on those those schedules to, because that is where, and they, and they show, I mean, there's yeah. two, three hundred people at those events, um, it, at least down in Wellfleet there are, and I know that, that it's uh, duplicated across the Cape, so um, that is, a, that would be one place for people to understand what's ahead of them if they come to live here, and what's ahead of them as homeowners. But we do have to step up the public relations aspect of what yeah. we do, um, but, mm -hmm. uh, 
corresponding to that is, is also we're working on something tangible so it can show progress, which is this regional wastewater management plan. And we've been working on it for some time, but it was more of a policy document. With the $150,000 earmark that we got from the state, thanks to uh, Senate President, Senator Wolf, and the rest of the delegation, uh, we're going to be moving forward to establish this plan. And I view this plan as an essential way of connecting a lot of the local work that's already been done on comprehensive wastewater management planning into a coherent regional plan, and in some ways as a way uh, forward, but also as a defensive mechanism to some of the, the, the plans that might be forced on us. Mm -hmm. And so the best defense is to be out there and have all the work done. And that's what we're going to take the next 12 to 18 months to do to produce this plan. And the plan will have uh, a lot of uh, graphic interface. It will be map-based. It will be easy to understand. And there will be several tools associated with it that will be helpful to citizens and towns as they start to plan for how to deal uh, with uh, um, remediating water quality. There will also be a fairly expanded component on um, alternatives and green infrastructure versus gray infrastructure. And, and uh, So I think this is going to be... Uh, when when it's all said and done, uh, a very good, solid plan. And I, I am, I'm hopeful, because it is a uh, collaborative effort, an effort to tie these local uh, processes together, will be the the uh, pathway forward, the sort of blue, blueprint for how to move forward. Okay. And, and the biggest, as we get out there up front and start to talk about cost, the biggest people, thing people want to know is they want some certainty. Well, what do you mean? And the biggest way to answer... I think uh, critics of the science, and it's a, it's a predictable process in every community. Everybody admits we have a problem. As soon as the town puts a price tag on it, they question uh, the science, then they question the engineering, and then they <coughs> vote, then they vote no at town meeting. Um, but a lot of those, not not all of them, but a lot of the the questions of engineering and science are really rooted in cost. So if we can establish that cost argument up front, we can get by that. If we can come up with a regional plan where people can more specifically see how this problem might be solved in total, uh, they're much more willing to to, uh, to receive it in a way and be open uh, to what our contribution would be and be effective advocates for additional state and federal support of the, of the plan. With regard to the uh, town meeting piece, uh, in Harwich, uh, Frank Sampson developed a, a high degree of credibility with, you know, with people and the result of which that every request for funding for, let's say, for wastewater <coughs> planning in the town got support at town meeting because of his personal yeah. credibility. It seems to me that we need to identify people like Frank Sampson in the other communities yeah. so that we have a point, not just yourself, but basically create, have a, tact a, 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 a tactical plan that identifies people <coughs> that can be, that can be, uh, uh, be a local representative of this interest and have an identity and a credibility in the community that they're, you know, that they're at, and we provide some way of supporting them. So I think that that might be a tactic that we, you know, that we, we might look at as to how do we identify someone that could be an ally that would provide what I'd call continuing pressure with regard to this issue and gain the, uh, you know, the credibility within the community to help move this whole process forward because as as well intended as we are, when we go to a community outside of the one that we live in, we're looked at as visitors. You know, I guess that'd be the most euphemistic thing, uh, but not somebody who's really rooted in that community and considered to be a you know a true stakeholder. So no, I think that's I, I another. Agree. I think the regional wastewater management plan is another process that would allow us to work with the community and find those kind of people. Okay. She just went stepped outside for a moment. She'll be back. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, we have your other goals here. Uh, uh, it's the economic opportunity. Oh yeah, the SEDS. 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 Let's see. Are we are we get, let's see. Open Cape is going to be on uh, underway. Uh, or be done. What are you going to do for that? What do What are you going to do first then? <laughs> well, Open Cape is extraordinarily important and. Uh, you know, we have uh, 16 regional projects that, been, uh, that were originally established. Open Cape was one of those projects, but it really marbles through a lot of the other ones. So we'll be doing another uh, SEDS update this year. We're also going to be doing another Smarter Cape Summit, 
it's going to be in Falmouth uh, this year at Seacrest. Um, and we're going to do that SEDS update at the summit this year. So I think that, that uh, there'll be a lot of involvement there in moving those regional projects forward. I would also. Visibility to it, that'd be good. Yeah, there'll be a lot of visibility. And the Smarter Cape partnership has been uh, really essential. And it sort of bleeds across a lot of other issues. And, and you'll be hearing more about Smarter Cape and, and uh, the potential to provide regional umbrella services. We've been working closely with the town of. Yarmouth and Ed Santillo there on e permitting plan. Uh, we're working with, in partnership with them to write a grant for that four million dollar uh, pool of regional resources that are available at the state level. Uh, and uh, the open Cape stuff will start to marble into um, economic development. Uh, you know, it, it's already become. I mean, they sort of live with us every day. But one of the things that we're considering uh, at the commission now is to take that open Cape. Uh, footprint of where that, that uh, pipeline is going to be. And then to look at our land use vision maps and to identify uh, industrial service and trade areas that are proximate to the Open Cape Cable. And to then establish within the Commission, probably in the springtime, uh, as we revisit the Regional Policy Plan, the authority to raise thresholds unilaterally in, in those, in those uh, industrial service and trade areas that have been identified by uh, the towns. Now, I think. Uh, that has huge potential and huge synergy because the kind of business you can attract at 40,000 square feet is, is a lot different than the kind of business you can attract at 10,000 square feet. And the ability of that broadband capacity and gigabyte capacity, uh, I think, will definitely attract um, people to, to the Cape to, to exploit that because we're going to be so far ahead of the rest of the state in many respects. I think that uh, that brings up the point about how do we communicate this to you know to the people on a regular basis. <coughs> and I'm going to suggest we talk offline about uh, perhaps uh, working on a report to the community on a, a program on a once a month basis, which is fairly which is easy enough to do because right. we just basically just you know sort of sit down and and uh, so, you know, sort of have have this kind of a conversation on a regular basis to bring people up to date. And, yeah. and, uh, so we'll do that, I think. So we'll, we'll continue to drive the SEDS uh, project. Um, we're in our third year now. It's a five-year update. Mm -hmm. So we should be updating it this year. But we should be looking to that sort of major five-year update and where we are. Open Cape should be completed at that point. Um, and, and that'll give us an opportunity to revisit some of the things. There are, there's a coastal, uh, a coastal communities kind of uh, SEDS project with working harbors and amplifying economic development and activity around those working harbors. There's one that that looks at any uh, uh, regional entities to support financially uh, some of the things that are happening in these redeveloped areas and redeveloping and revitalizing areas. Um, and so a lot of these programs uh, will be coming forward. But what I would suggest is that we have a separate meeting and we go through the 16 priority projects probably in a February, March time frame before we get uh, to the Smarter Cape annual update so that I can get the commissioner's direct feedback on that. And we'll be able to show you the progress there. The other thing I would mention in that regard is that we are beginning now to implement project management software at the, at the Cape Cod Commission. And we're working with County IT and Peter Carlson on that. <coughs> the, it is really geared towards projects like the, the SEDS projects. Because with 16 regional uh, priority projects, we had different um, project leads on each one, and, and uh, most of them were not the Cape Cod Commission or a county entity. So uh, to be able to manage those projects and keep them moving forward is going to require a dip, uh, this kind of tool. So I'm excited about that, not only uh, for the SEDS, but on the regulatory program on the administrative side. It will uh, make things much uh, more efficient, and it will really allow us to continue to break down those silos that people tend to work in at the commission in the county. I, I just wanted to um, talk about Economic Development Council. Um, I attended a couple of, not last month, the month before, and there was discussion about going forward in the partnership that you had there. And what impressed me was um, sort of your report to date on how you've used those monies and, and uh, the work you're doing with your reset team. And um, you might want to discuss that reset team and, and what it does for towns. Yeah. Uh, going into them and the work that's that has been done and is uh, in process of doing. I know you're doing tremendous amounts of work up in Bourne. I know you've done a lot of work in Yarmouth uh, in the last year. So um, and and how is that going? And and uh, it looked like 
I was just wondering what was going on with that conversation. Well, the resources from the EEC that the Commission gets supports the SEDS project. Mm -hmm. um, it supports uh, the Stats Cape Cod, the information that we have there, and there's been a major upgrade to our website, but a major upgrade to Stats Cape Cod uh, also. And uh, it's one of our most popular pages now, because okay. now we have the ability, we have the analytics that we didn't have before to see who's checking on what page. And that Stats Cape Cod uh, page, it, everybody's using. So there's a ton of useful information there. The third is the reset team, and that's really an ability of the commission now to put several professionals, whether they're transportation, water, plant, or legal professionals, in towns to support uh, specific efforts that they have underway uh, there, so that we can go in and amplify on a temporary basis their capacity staff-wise to accomplish certain um, economic development-related goals as that relate to zoning, uh, primarily, and, and design issues. And so we spent a thousand hours in Yarmouth uh, last year at the Parker's River area. That's led to an initial proposal by some uh, private people that want to develop there and some conversations with uh, the state over the Parker's River Bridge, which is a combination of a wastewater project with the covered expansion there mm -hmm. and economic development and some uh, discussions with uh, the commissioner and the secretary as it relates to Yarmouth's marina project, which is also there. So that's an example of what the reset team can do. They worked, we had four people worked exclusively with the planning committee there. Um, That's not until it's six year. But you just... Yeah, we were only there last year. Oh, okay. And because, they made... It, 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 didn't we yeah, it was it on a committee gives. that went over there and looked at that about five years ago. Yeah. And that's sort of been the frustration. Is it? And, you know, this is not, this is a frustration that I see Cape White. So, so it's, when I got to Barnstable and High Ends, it was, a, you know, people here are, they know what they want these communities to be. They know how they want to revitalize them. It's the implementation that trips people up. And so I think that's sort of the, the expertise that we can provide is how mm -hmm. to sort of get beyond that. In Bourne, we're working on the north side on a growth incentive zone in Buzzards Bay, uh, the development of a, of a green tech park um, that's also on the north side. We've been working with their wastewater um, commission up there extensively and a lot of good work not only on the wastewater side, but ident identifying potential water supply issues that, that are all going to constrain the kind of growth that they want if they don't figure these things out first. And then on the south side, uh, we've been working with a land use vision map uh, generally and looking at industrial service and trade areas uh, primarily down there and how we might help that move forward. Also looking at, at uh, substantial transportation improvements. Next year, Belmont Circle is going to be part of our uh, unified work plan. Are they doing anything about parking garages? I haven't heard anything specifically about parking garages in, in Bourne. Um, it seems but, to be the key to a lot of the transportation interconnectivity. Well, you know, I think, as I sort of look nationally about revitalization projects, what you, what you generally need is uh, a sort of theme around, like for Hyannis it was the connection of the harbor, this mm -hmm. walkway to the sea thing that sort of permeated through everything. And you need somebody who is a local investor who's well capitalized and is willing to take a risk and spend money up front. Uh, and that's the, those are the two key factors. To, and you also need the involvement of local government from the highest level. And those are sort of the three legs of the stool where revitalization works. In Bourne, I think we have those components lining up. Uh, but the theme in Bourne <coughs> really is more around transportation. When you look at the bridges and the canal and the rail connection, mm -hmm. Uh, you know that, and redefining mm -hmm. itself around that, I think, is essential. So they've taken major steps in that direction. But Belmont Circle's up, and then we're looking on the other side at uh, the Bourne Rotary and MacArthur Boulevard. Or take, you know, I think we really need a transportation study out there to figure out what we're going to do over the next 25 years. So that's reset in Bourne. We have also had a request from Sandwich, and another town this morning that will remain nameless until it's formalized. And then uh, we worked in Chatham on West Main Street. Chatham has asked us to come back and do another project in Chatham. And then we just sort of worked in, on uh, Orleans Main Street, too. We did some great work over there. Town of the Harkin's been, been helping that sort of revitalization effort down there. So the Reset team has, has, <coughs> has been around the block in its short sort of existence. And so with uh, the information stats, Cape Cod, the said support, the Reset team, I think we're maximizing and leveraging more than one dollar to one dollar for what our EDC support is. Um, having said that, as is predictable, the EDC's commitment to the commission was three years. 
and the initial sort of discussion was to build capacity at the commission, and that means staff. Uh, so, and we did that. And so we're three years into this. We're going back to discuss now. And we've put in a request this year that is um, sixty thousand dollars less than what we what we have requested in, in the past, and that's because we've been able to bring in some federal planning money <coughs> from EDA to offset some of those costs. So I've been trying to hold uh, firm on my commitment to use the initial investment to find other sources, and when we find those other sources, to decrease our request from the EDC. But as you know, uh, you know, it's this is a sort of what have you done for me lately business, and people get used to you. If you're good, they get used to that level of good. When you raise the bar, they get used to the bar being there. And you know, you have we'll a face that with human service in the next budget round. Well, you, 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 but you have a, you know, the council is there, and they're great people, and they're great to get advice from. But you know, I think you know, there's always those those uh, inclinations every year that, well, we want all the money because we want to do something different. Yeah. And so there was, there's been a little bit of a, a, a ripple around that. I think they're going to meet on Friday and sort of discuss that. But, you know, I've made it clear to them that um, if there's a decrease uh, beyond the request to the commission, um, that's going to be reflected in, in it's going to impact staff and impact our capacity to provide these services at the same level. Um, but that's a, that's a big decision. And I don't begrudge them. They're going to advise you. You're going to make the allocation. And I don't, I don't begrudge them their point of view on this. But it's something that we need to, I need to know uh, in December because we've got to prepare our FY13 budget uh, going forward. And uh, I need to know if, if, the, if the paradigm's going to shift and we're not going to take those money and put them into unified staff resources to leverage additional money to give direct services to the towns then I need to make some of those adjustments. And, and our economic development policies will probably shift too, because we'll have to look for new partners. Um, and so we'll have to you know, revisit some of that. Uh, you know, I, I guess you know, I felt three years ago they offered a five-year commitment. I said I only wanted three, because if we couldn't, within three, start to demonstrate the value of what we were doing, then you know, we weren't doing something right. I think we've demonstrated that value. Um, but having said that, I think a lot of people interpret those comments as only needing three years of resources. But when you when you sort of look at the capacity built at the commission, there's no way that we could sustain that uh, going it, forward. If I can just follow <coughs> up, it, it brought you know we had you know, I think one time sta stated here, and I believe it was you, Bill, that pointed out that um, you know the the Keep Cut Commission was the designated economic development um, engine. And there, there probably wouldn't have been, yes, yeah, 16 yeah. times. And um, there probably wouldn't have been an EDC had that um, component been developed um, successfully in the commission the last 20 years. And, and now it looks like it is. And, and what I sensed is, you know, when you have Open Cape, which is a big, big, fat success, and it brings in, you know, a big grant to allow this happen, you say, well, oh, there's a project that's, that's successful. But that is just really the bones of many other things that to come. And so um, everybody looks for that other big, the, the next big thing, whereas it is a process. And, um, you know, the more, you know, I mean, the more you, 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 um, you know, you're involved in government and watching these things happen. And I, and I think, um, I don't know if you were there at the special commission where they went around and, and talked to, you know, every member introduced themselves. But they had the three town, as they sit together on that commission, um, Charlie, uh, Bud, and uh, Bob, Bob, Bud Dunham and Bob Lawton. Um, and, you know, it was Bud that just sort of off the cuff expressed the work that the county does for Sandwich and in particular how um, of the commission... Off the cuff, it was well planned. It was, yeah. well, I mean, no, it, but I mean, no, he, he but had, I mean, he said, you know, I, I really wasn't, you know, prepared for this, but I mean, he knew his, he knew exactly, um, he didn't have to think very long, but, um, you know, he was talking about the work that was done on the Golden Triangle and how mm -hmm. the commission came in and he helped to sort out all of these things and how that would have never happened because the towns just don't have the resources. They just, they still would have been, you know, sort of stuck in this, the state of we want to move forward, but we don't know how to do it, and um, I, it's sort of unseen progress, but it's progress, and it's it's very important work towards progress, and I think that that's that's what you know I was sort of hearing the back and forth, and, <coughs> and also you have new members in the EDC that 
Yes, we the, the new discussions. members of the EDC. Uh, <laughs> I have several Excuse of them up for reappointment. Um, they may be. I don't, I don't know that. They're probably not. I don't know that. But yeah, not the new one. I, I think, the, in going back a little bit further, mm -hmm. was, um, uh, was the time when the EDC was actually created, back in, what, 98? Because the EDC was really uh, more of a, it was more of a chamber. It wasn't totally a chamber. It was a county organization, but it split because the chamber felt that they needed to do something in the way of economic development. And then the county at the time <coughs> believed that it needed to retain that, that economic development mission mm -hmm. because it was important for the government Absolutely. to have that role in economic development. And I recall at the time uh, uh, that that happened, that uh, it was, okay, well now if we're this, how are we going to function? And it was a while getting, getting that together. Well, I and and if, you, if you remember too, there was, there was another discussion about whether or not there should be a Department of Economic Development for the county. And that never flew either because that really wasn't how it should get done. So the EDC has sort of evolved over time, and now I, I don't know where I understand there are some people who now want to take another look at it in terms of its mission and where some of those license plate funds go and all of that. But that's always been a bit of a of a talking point, if you will, about how those yeah. funds are used. And I understand some of the new members. So. Yeah, I, 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 if the. I think the phrase that was used at the time was supposed to be lean but not mean, well, and, and also to reduce <coughs> the amount of cost of, of, say, of putting the money in the street. And, yeah. the, and the, the thing that I remember pushing for at the time was we have to get money on the street within a very short period of time to show that we're viable. Otherwise, the justification of all the money going over the Chamber of Commerce would be there. The point that, you know, that you're making is that we are the only organization, the government is the only organization that, that represents the constituents. The Chamber of Commerce represents its members, so that you know this mm -hmm. was you know, this was a a very important point, and that's and we did get it we did get it organized to the point of getting established, but we never, to this day, we've never gotten the leverage that I always thought we had a responsibility to develop with the you know with the funding from the license plate money to bring other money in. Well, well, the well, funding's not that great. If I can make, if I can make a, my, my argument... You know, we're, it's approaching noontime, and we haven't even gotten to why we're... I mean, okay. we are talking about why we're here. Yeah, it, the we only need thing to I, pull this together. The EDC thing's probably going to come your way, I want to wish every woman. And my parting comment on that is that there was a lot of heat and light when, the, when it split. Right. Um, and there was a lot of politics involved. Um, but when I look back, I see a reason why it split. And it's really a philosophical reason which is, you know, the Chamber is a membership-driven organization. And to the extent that the license plate money should be used to recruit and attract businesses to come here, that's really a Chamber function. Mm -hmm. Or to bet on emerging industries, that's really a Chamber function. The function of the government related, it, and this is my philosophy, isn't to gamble on particular emerging industries. Uh, it's really about infrastructure. It's building infrastructure and reducing the regulatory burden and trying to, to form government so that you can provide incentives to get the kind of development you want in the right place. And so that's that's sort of, and it's and the, the EDC on the county side has the ability to look 20 years out, where the EDC money at the chamber probably doesn't. So I think it's a, it's a good balance. But, you know, I think sometimes the, the county economic development council can stray into the uh, chamber's sort of, Venue and sometimes the chamber comes. Mm -hmm. So I think you know defining those roles and responsibilities. You know, four years ago when I got here, has made for an extraordinarily harmonious uh, mm -hmm. relationship with, with the with chamber, the chamber. At least from a working mm -hmm. perspective. You know, Wendy Northcross is part of the Smarter Cape um, outfit, and they are meeting right now, and we meet weekly uh, at noon every Wednesday, so that we can keep our progress moving on that Smarter mm -hmm. Cape thing. So I think enough said on the yes. Yeah. Okay, so at this point, uh, I guess we should. Uh, do we go through the numbers? Or? No, no, we're gonna. No, we're gonna put. The, those. No, we're gonna put the numbers together. Okay. Yeah. And I think the whole idea is that we we agree with the goal. At least I agree with the goals that Paul has outlined, and we need to incorporate those in our in our evaluation statement. And and. 
I don't think there's any uh, any one of us that uh, you know that, to have a different opinion. I think that this has been a very valuable and useful you know conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, there is a lot of work to do, and uh, and uh, and I I hope that you share with me the you know the, the feeling that anything that we can do to move this wastewater project forward, we're ready to do that. Mm -hmm. You know we're you know we. we we understand that you know, it does not happen by saying, okay, go out and take that, go out and do that. All of us have to work, you know, in support of each other in order to, you know, in order to deliver a product that's so important for the community. I agree. Yeah. So with that, I guess, uh, do we have I guess we can say just good job. Yeah. Yeah. No? What? I don't have, do you have any other questions or? No? Any areas of improvement, things you'd like to oh, say? Oh, yeah. You should spend a little bit more time cultivating uh, you know, counting numbers over the assembly. <laughs> we've talked about that. Yeah, we've talked about that. <laughs> well, I have some ideas about, but I mean, I think uh, in terms of the commission and county relationships. Yeah. But I, I have some thoughts, but I don't think this is probably the time to okay. talk about them because I think they're more in the in the real planning function. Yeah. Um, um, but something like the idea of an IT department that could serve both the commission and the county. As opposed to each site, because you have a group, you have a IT group that, and some they're not all employees either. I know you hire people from the outside. You get your, you you can achieve your goals. I think here we have a little more difficulty achieving our IT goals. Yes. And maybe it might be a good idea to have one IT that actually serves both, so that so that the county can um, uh, can help achieve some of its goals in a way that. That you're able to achieve. Yeah. The IT I mean, it's something to think about. To be your IT department. We, uh, yeah, we technically yeah, I know. get our IT services from the county. Right. Um, we pay for, continue to pay mm -hmm. for one position of the IT right. uh, department. Um, but I would love to have that conversation. Yeah. And I think there is a tremendous opportunity for improvement in that area. And it is, um, you know, my philosophy sort of. As I look out 20 years from now, I think the future of regional government really is in information. It's mm -hmm. certainly not in competing with the towns to provide direct services, but it's in uh, collecting information, aggregating it, analyzing it, uh, and being able to provide that information back to towns and to use it on a regional level, level to leverage more uh, resources for the region so that uh, the towns and the region can continue to, to provide high quality services for a lower cost to taxpayers. So, and it's uh, essential, and if you look at some of the new things that are going to be coming forward, the economy of scale for that aggregation of information really is at the regional level. There seems to be something in the procurement of some of these uh, information services that's magic about the number 250,000, so. Right. Okay. Thank you. Good well, job, thank you. Paul. Thank yes, you. good Better job, Paul. Good job. Thank Great you. job. Yep, Great thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're done. <laughs> we're done. I'm not going to leave I think we yeah. are. Yeah. Come on. So now we're all heading over to Barnstable Town Hall. Oh, the Barnstable, the Great I, Hall. I just had this town idea of the great that town this, the Orleans group, that I've been trying to understand where they're coming from, and I somehow think that they are not totally convinced that nitrogen is the real That's problem. Exactly. That there are other things out there. We all know that phosphorus is definitely a problem. Only fresh water. And also we Only know that water. the pharmaceuticals and the personal care products are a problem. But I think that somehow they think that because the TMDLs are focused on nitrogen, that that if that isn't enough. And if we spend all of our money dealing with nitrogen, we're going to find all these other things there, and then we won't have any money to take care of them. So that Do not let is a little... the perfect be the enemy of good. Well, what I also want to just state to that is that by the time there is consensus and there is actual whatever the plan may be going forward and that there are plants being uh, built, uh, number one, we're going to be lucky if we're alive, never mind, you know, um, this is a 50-year, we have to put this, and we have to even put the costs associated out in a 50-year plan. That's why the SRF was built around a 50-year payback. Um, this goes beyond our lifetime, and uh, I would imagine that there are going to be uh, systems available by the time the building is, the building of these systems, that will, that will consider personal and um, these other 
these other uh, elements that, that people can look to, herbicides, fertilizers, all of those things, yes, they do contribute, but the facts state that it's 85% human, is human waste right. to our wastewater problem. So um, you can't, <coughs> yeah, that's not like, you know, it's, it's close, close in proximity in, in percentage wise. So I move to adjourn. I second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.